Oh my gosh, I don't have a job anymore. Are the robots taking over? Do I need to start looking for another job? In a world where machines don't sleep, Human, don't doubt, and never taken. hesitate, in the not so distant future, robots have taken over the world and the operating room. Skill was automated, compassion was erased, humanity deleted from the code. Surgeons became obsolete, hospitals turned cold, but one didn't step aside. One surgeon stands alone. This is the Surgeon Unmasked. Thanks, welcome back. Please like, comment, subscribe if you don't mind. It helps us a lot. Let's us know that you want us to keep doing these. There's more things you'd like to hear about. But today I want to talk about robots, computers, technology assistance or aid, if you will, in the operating room. Our first five episodes were sort of five insider tips on a number of different topics relating to hip and knee joint replacement surgery. I'm going to start a new series now on technology, modern technology in orthopedics, particularly as it relates to hip and knee replacement today, because there's a lot out there, a lot that's emerging that I think it would help to have kind of an explainer on and kind of tell you what we know, what we don't know. Very frequently, one of the first questions out of a lot of patients' mouths or do you do a robotic surgery? I'm going to talk about that today and the various technologies we use in the operating room to assist us in surgery, what they mean, what's proven, what's known about them, and do you really need them? Why do we hear about it so much? Well, there's a big marketing push, particularly in the world of robotics. These are very expensive machines, usually seven figures, and the manufacturers of those machines typically are also manufacturers of the implants. So they have a very vested interest of getting penetration of these robots. And I'm not saying robots are bad or good. I'll talk about all of that. But that's why we hear so much about it is because of a large marketing push. Now, hospitals are eager to buy them because then they can attract surgeons and attract patients and cases to their hospital. That helps their bottom line. So these costs don't directly apply to you as the patient, but they do get passed on and the overall spend on healthcare. So how did we get here with this sort of push, particularly in the world of knee replacement? That's mostly what I'm going to be focusing on today. Some of these technologies exist for hip replacements as well. But the problem is hip replacement's pretty good. It's in pretty good shape. So there's not this major push to try and find some new innovative way to improve something that's already quite good. Additionally, we can usually with fluoroscopy and intraoperative x-ray take care of all the imaging we need in terms of navigation, positioning, and things like that. In the knee replacement world, it's a little bit different. So when we talk about technology or technological assistance in the operating room, I sort of look at it as three broad categories. We start with a basic manual instrumentation. In the middle, we have what's called computer navigation. And on the very end, we have what's called robotic surgery. And robotic surgery has been very successful, very popular in other fields, particularly general surgery and neurology. It's gaining penetration in orthopedics. But as we'll talk about, little is known if really makes a difference and certainly is it worth or does it justify the costs that are involved which are pretty intense so starting with basic manual instrumentation and by the way that's how my knee replacement was performed and i was totally happy with that manual instrumentation generally involves using rods or jigs that align themselves to your bone they can either be put outside the leg what we call an extra medullary guide or we can put the rod inside the bone to better align itself to the canal there's pros and cons to both of those but that's the tried and true standard way of doing a knee replacement even today the next step up is navigation computer navigation that is what i use and i have used pretty much my entire career computer navigation essentially takes a 3d map of the surface of the the knee joint as well as the position of the hip joint above the ankle joint below and allows us to more precisely make the cuts at the angle we want. It also provides some assistance and help when the bone itself has deformity that would prevent us from accurately using the manual instruments to assess where those cuts need to be. Robotics, being the third one, is essentially computer navigation, but with the added feature that the robot actually makes the cuts for you. What do we know about these technologies? What's better? Well, I'll show you some data. We really have no proof that navigation is any better than manual and that robotics is any better than navigation. For that matter, we have no proof that any of these technologies make a clinical difference. Now, they've all been shown from navigation all the way up to robotics to make the x-ray look better. In other words, to be more precise with the alignment and the cuts. 
I know in my own experience since using navigation, I've seen fewer outliers in terms of the angle that we want the leg to be in. So it does give us that reassurance, but it has not shown any proven benefit to improving patients' outcomes, at least in the long term, or reducing their need for reoperation or revision surgery down the road. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of each method, manual methods, probably the quickest, fastest, certainly the least expensive way to perform the surgery. I think it generally helps to have more experienced surgeons, particularly with those instruments. The opponents of it say that, well, you're going to have more outliers, more cases where you're outside of that accepted range in terms of the angle deviation that we're trying to put the knee in. Other concerns is that when you enter the intermedullary canal of the bone, which the bone's hollow in the center with the exception of some marrow contents, is that that can create complications. You can induce what are called fat emboli, where pieces of fat or blood or material or even little bits of bone can get pressurized, pushed in the bloodstream and cause problems like a pulmonary embolism. But there's no question that manual instrumentation is still, in my mind, the gold standard. One of my biggest concerns is that we're reaching a time when many surgeons that are coming out in training have very little experience with manual instruments. This would be akin to a pilot flying an airplane who doesn't really know how to fly the airplane. If the autopilot ever goes down, they're in big trouble. So I do worry a little bit about that lost skill, that lost art. The other way I would compare these technologies, it's a little bit like cars are today. Navigation would be essentially telling you where to go, what's the fastest route, et cetera. Whereas robotics would be more akin to full self-driving or cars like Waymo's, et cetera, that not only know the route to go, but they actually do the driving themselves. So when I was part of the training program here and we trained fellows, we obviously would interview a bunch of candidates every year. And my favorite question to ask at the end of each interview, and I still have yet to hear a satisfactory answer from any of the candidates, is what is the advantage of robotics over navigation? Because what most of them fall in love with is the navigation, and it is pretty slick. It gives you complete plans and details, and it's probably more than I want to go into here, but it allows not only you to accurately make the cuts, but also determine what tension you need to put on the ligaments, what the cuts need to be angled at, so the knee is what we call balanced. And that's the ultimate goal of the knee replacement. Number one, it be aligned, and two, it be balanced. So there's equal tension on the ligaments, so the joint stays relatively connected the whole time, if you will. We call it keeping all four wheels on the road, but through a full arc of motion, we want there to be sort of steady, constant contact between the two parts of the knee, the femur above, the shin bone below. But I never got a satisfactory answer out of any of the candidates. And I think most of them are enamored by what the navigation can do. And because robots are being pushed so heavily, a lot of them haven't just seen plain navigation because, well, that's not where the money is. It's in the robotics. But the idea that you can use a robot to make a saw blade cut through a slotted block, and I'll show you some pictures of this, and that make a big difference in the operation, to me is sort of asinine. The other problem I have with robotics is that it requires the use of pens. You have to place pens into the bone away and outside of the incision typically in order to stabilize the monitors that are used, what we call arrays, so that the robot can see exactly where everything is. And the earlier part of my career, I used some navigation systems that require that. And fortunately, the one I use now does not. All the pens are inside of the incision and they go into places where you're essentially removing the bone anyway. But we would see pens break. We would see people get infections from pens. We would see pens cause fractures. Those holes they create, create weaknesses in the bone and people can actually break or fractures th through them. So it's not an entirely benign idea to put pens into the bone. And it certainly adds significant time to the operation. The other problem is that if something gets screwed up with the robot, it doesn't really know. And I have seen cases where a, an array or a, gets shifted and you basically get what we call a frame shift where everything is off maybe five millimeters this way or five millimeters that way. And it's made massive cuts into the bone where they're not supposed to be. So it does require significant supervision. All of these robots require training classes. And I did, I've gone through training for a couple of the robots Good and have chosen you. not to use it in my practice. And I am not saying anything bad about those who do. And I think you can have a very good result 
with a number of different ways of doing a knee replacement. But the idea that one of these is proven superior to the other is simply not proven. My other concern about robotic surgery is that it adds time to the operation. And there is a direct correlation between the length of your surgery and the risk of an infection. Now, most people who are good at them, that becomes a sort of negligible increase and they can get quite efficient with it. I will admit that my use of navigation probably adds maybe five minutes to the procedure where I just using purely manual annual instrumentation, but generally not very much. So the other thing I think people don't really fully understand about robotic surgery is that the, the robot is making the cuts. It's determining where to make the cuts, but it's still not doing the lion's share of the surgery, such as the approach, the releasing of soft tissues, the removal of bone spurs, some critical things that are part of the procedure. So the idea that the surgeon just checks in and sits in the corner of the room while the robot does the operation is just not true. Now, I will say with evolving technology and particularly artificial intelligence, and I'll quote my partner here, I think probably has a pretty good handle on what the future looks like with artificial intelligence. And forever we thought we needed to be highly educated and the people who existed in the thought field were probably most protected long term. Well, he tells his son, you better learn to use your hands because the, the one lead we have in the world of computers and technology is that our ability to manually manipulate and deal with fine tissues and three-dimensional spaces is still overall superior to a robot. Now, once a robot's trained and told exactly what to do, it can do a pretty remarkable job to a high degree of precision. But we're a long way from a robot ever doing the entire operation, whereas other thought-related fields, such as internal medicine, where it's more of a decision-making field, I do worry about them and their future and what artificial intelligence can do. I am going to plan on having an episode, and I'm going to challenge ChatGPT on some knowledge questions within our field that are pretty highly technical. I will tell you, and I'm, we'll talk more about AI down the road, that in the majority of cases, when I ask ChatGPT even pretty complicated orthopedic questions, it's remarkably good. But here's the problem. You don't know when it's wrong because it sounds so confident, so self-assured, and it sounds like it knows what it's talking about. But many times I've seen it be completely false. So that's the hard part. Generally, I would say it's a pretty good resource, probably better than going to Google and sifting through a bunch of websites. The chat GPT in general has a pretty good grasp of the proven medical literature when it answers questions like this, but it does get a little overconfident. And I think I'd be a little careful there and sift through that information pretty carefully. So what would I do? I would find out what that surgeon does well. I would make sure he's experienced in whatever technology he's using. But I'd also want to know that he's got a backup. If he can, if the computer system goes down, either through navigation or robotic, that he's got a pretty robust experience with manual instruments as well. If that autopilot goes down, someone's got to land that airplane. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Please leave us a comment. Let us know if there's something else you'd like to hear about. We'll see you next time.